Thanks very much for being on the programme. You're very welcome. Good to have you. Um, so Labour didn't just lose the last election. You had your worst election result since 1935, mm -hmm. losing seats that you've never lost before. Mm -hmm. What do you think went wrong? Look, it was, uh, there's no one thing that went wrong. And in some of the seats that we've, we've never lost before or that we've held for 100 years, there, there is definitely what feels like a, a new line in the sand from previous losses. There's no doubt about that. What you heard on the doorstep, what you heard wherever you were in the country, was that basically people didn't trust the Labour Party on a number of things, but the fundamental was trust. So they didn't trust leadership, they didn't trust our positions on the big issues of the day. In lots of cases, they didn't know what they were. And also, they just didn't trust that we could deliver the things that we were saying. It's not to say they didn't like the things that we were saying. Um, it's just that extra bit of the issue where they could trust us to deliver. Is there any bit of the manifesto that you would have got rid of then? I mean, I, I think that uh, the, the broadband issue went down appallingly badly in my constituency where I found out uh, on the day that it was announced that how many open reach employees I had in my constituency that I didn't know about. But actually things that fundamentally are popular with those who have struggled for them, even the WASPI, um, the WASPI commitment, we, I have hundreds, thousands of WASPI women in my constituency. It's the women's pensions issue. So the women's pensions issue. Um, I have, yeah, and we've had a pressure group and worked towards that, but it wasn't that they didn't like it, they just didn't believe it could be delivered. So the manifesto, it's not, it's not necessarily that any one thing is particularly wrong with it. It's that people just didn't believe we could deliver those things. And people are shrewd. People recognise that you, you can't have everything and, and, and that things have to be paid for and things have to be budgeted for. Um, you said that people didn't trust the leadership. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I, I think we need to draw a line and, uh, and talk a little bit more about the future. But the reality is, is that on doorsteps, wherever you knocked doors, north, south, east, west, the issue of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership came up. There's, n there's no point anyone trying to pretend otherwise and people I think that people found in the campaign specifically it difficult when they felt that he wouldn't answer questions and some of that brand about the principle was lost in in the not answering the questions but yeah you know that people I don't think saw him as a prime minister do you think he was a good leader <laughs> my criticism of Jeremy Corbyn has been widely reported I think that he should there should have been uh, instituted in the party a long way into his leadership, much more listening approach where all the voices in the party, um, in the parliamentary Labour Party, in the party membership were, were heard a bit more and weren't just considered as, you know, dissent in bad faith and disloyalty. When we were speaking up about things that we didn't like, we were doing it because we could see that there were problems coming, whether that was on the Brexit position, from the membership's point of view, or from the position of how we were handling foreign affairs, from the Parliamentary Labour Party's issue. I just, I think that a good leader needs to recognise dissent and be able to listen to it. Another thing that clearly people had an issue with when mm -hmm. it came to the Labour Party election, election was Brexit. Mm -hmm. It was a Brexit election in many ways and people didn't like what you had to say. Um, now, you've repeatedly argued that we'd be better off in the EU. Mm -hmm. You campaigned for a second referendum. Your campaign team has got lots of people from the Remain side in it, including Will Straw, the director of Stronger In. I mean, are you the Uber Remain candidate of this contest? I, I love the idea that I'm an Uber Remainer. I mean, I, I voted to, to trigger Article 50 because that is what my constituents voted for. But I think that any politician that doesn't look at the situation that they have in front of them about what would be best for the people that they represent, best for everybody in the country, and take the position that they think is right to do the right thing. I, 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 I'm certainly not some sort of uber remainer. I don't have, like, I, don't, I don't shroud myself in the flag. I don't have a big loud hailer outside Westminster. As a politician, I will always look at what is in front of me and try and do what is the best thing. I don't... You, say, you say it's the best thing, though, but lots of people who voted Labour previously, voted Labour for generations and didn't at the last election, did not think that staying in the EU was the right thing. They disagree with you. Oh, yeah. And I think that that's okay. The country, we've got into this position that when 
people disagree on individual issues as if you can't then be trusted on anything else. It's a really dangerous culture where we think that people, people in my constituency, 62% Leave vote and the Labour vote in my constituency fell by the smallest amount in any Leave seat and yet I was clear with my constituents on my position on uh, the European Union or how I felt that we needed to handle what was going on at the time. People are okay if you are clear and you are honest about what you think and then they will give you a hearing on other issues. So, you know, I, I, I'm not an Uber Remainer. I don't wish, feel the need to represent myself as an Uber Remainer. I am a politician who will do what I think is right, sometimes when that is hard, and I will be honest with the country about doing that. And in my constituency, they are fine with that. Do you know what they say to me more than anything else? They say, we don't always agree with you, Bab, but we know you'll always tell us what you think. And, you know, you know we know you're on our side. I'm talking about being honest uh, and open and telling uh, people what you think. If you were a Labour leader, could you ever campaign to rejoin the EU? I, I, I don't think that this is a conversation that is even open for debate at the moment. We are leave Boris Johnson has a majority of 80. That has consequences. In a, an election that was handed to him, he now has holds all of the cards and he can have carte blanche to do what he wants. We are leaving the European Union. And I don't even think amongst people who voted Remain in the original referendum, that there is any appetite to carry on having a constitutional conversation when we should be talking about the things that people actually talk about. So the, there is no plan to have some sort of campaign to rejoin the European Union, but any Prime Minister who wouldn't look at the merits of every single alliance that our country could have for our safety, security, peace and uh, economic viability with a reasoned head on, anyone who closes off their, their any option in the future, I just don't believe that that's an honest position and people can say it to you, they can sit in an interview and say to you, I will never, and I just think politics has got to be more honest and... Mm. So you could, potentially? Well, it's very unlikely at this stage, isn't it? We're leaving the European Union and I don't think that there is any appetite. Also. We've got to make sure that as we leave the European Union, this isn't about me hoping that it fails. I don't hope that Boris Johnson causes calamity in the country. I don't hope that I am right about the economic. I, I hope that the people in my constituency and all across the country don't lose their jobs. This is about scrutinising what was promised to the people and making sure that the best thing can happen in our country. This isn't a political point scoring point. This is about working to make the best thing happen. Um, I'm interested as well to talk about some of the potential policies that we could see uh, if you are a Labour leader. You talked about childcare this week, wanting to make childcare free from the age of nine months. Um, how much would that cost? Well, look, the conversation, what I am saying about not just childcare, but how we need to be looking after people's families and how we need to be making an industrial strategy essentially about work that actually deals with the realities of so people's how, lives. How much would it cost? But the question about how much it will cost is absolutely something that is going to have to be worked out over the next few years. But it's not, it's not just saying, oh, well, what will you cut to do this? What will you? We need to have a really honest conversation with the public about childcare, about social care, about the things that stop families being able to get on and talking to them about how we're going to pay for that uh, through different tax but systems. Surely, through... surely part of that honest conversation, and, and look, I, I absolutely accept your point that free childcare is one of the things that would hugely benefit the lives mm -hmm. of many, many people in this country, mm -hmm. but you can't say how much it would cost. I mean, surely that's one of the things you've got to work out well, straight away, isn't it? But this is, a leadership, this is the leadership contest. We are not going to be in government for four years. What I am saying is that we need to have a conversation with the public about the things that, would actually, that they actually talk about. And that social care, that is not being able to go back to work, not being able to afford to buy a house where they live. These are all issues about how people actually live that politicians very rarely touch upon the actual lives of actual people. And we have got to have conversations with if people want services, and this is one of the problems of where we've gone wrong in the past, 
people know that services have to be paid for and we've got to talk about exactly what services people need whether they can be delivered well because one of the problems with the way that services get delivered is that we go for the cheapest path of least resistance and you end up with old older adults being put to bed at 5:30 because that's the funding model that can be afforded we have got to go out to the country have a conversation about what they want what they need and what they are willing to pay for and how that will be paid for um, one of the other big services of course is education something that many people um, feel really strongly about mm -hmm. labor conference voted to abolish private schools would you support that look i i worry about some of the messaging and how that that hit home because you know i i have a friend who has a daughter with autism who is in a state funded place at a private school and what she heard when we said that was you're you're a baddie and you shouldn't be doing that so like judging children. parents basically yeah and i you know every parent's responsibility is to their own child a government's responsibility is to every child i think that private schools should be treated like businesses not like charities and they should be taxed accordingly but i think that having an abolitionist route at this stage it's going to be need to be a whole system change but we should talk about making sure that every single state school is somewhere my kids go to the local state school and it is an outstanding school and people desperately want their children to go there that is the situation that we have to get into so that people don't feel that they can buy advantage and buy privilege there is so many things wrong with the private school system though and and how unfair the advantage it gives i mean just look where i work how many uh, there's certainly not been any prime ministers who went to the schools i went to or the schools my kids went to but how, how many is it from Eton? i think we're up to 30. <laughs> um one of the um other things that i want to ask you about is drugs you've been quite open in the past about taking drugs yeah would you like to see drugs decriminalized do you know what i'm open to this conversation and i cha i changed my mind and i'm going to be a politician who admits when i change my mind on this um when i was younger i definitely thought of course we should uh, decriminalize uh, drugs um, but actually when i became a local councillor and a member of parliament i saw the level of effect that antisocial behavior has on communities when uh, and feeling that you can't do anything about it and and i feel quite hard line about how currently drugs policy and cu currently the way that drugs are not fought against at all actually if you call the police for somebody dealing drugs in the house next door to you the likelihood that anything will happen is is very little and people want to see hard action however in funnily enough during the tory uh, contest when everybody started talking about who oh, taken which drugs i think that a, a more honest conversation about how we're losing the war on drugs started and i am definitely open to different models around decriminalization but i'm not here saying that you know all drugs should be free and <laughs> everything you should be able to buy it in every shop i think but i think we do need to have a conversation because what we're doing now is currently not working no fewer people are taking drugs people drug deaths are rising risk is rising and crime is being wildly affected by it um, now just talking a bit more about your um campaign mm -hmm. labor clearly needs to unite find a way of uniting the party yeah. from you know people on the left people in the center ground uh, people who are for and against brexit people in cities and towns some would argue that you're quite a divisive candidate I and mean, you told diane abbott to f off you resigned from uh, jeremy corbyn's um in, in as pps in 2016 saying to jeremy corbyn i'm worried you can't see that you've made this all about you are you really the person to unite people look you know i i, was, uh, I feel that some of the way that we talk about the Labour Party is not at all my experience of it at all going around constituency Labour parties all over the country for the last four years I think that we have to be very careful that we don't believe uh, what you see online and there are people who don't like me in the Labour Party just as much as there are people who don't like Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party but everybody in the Labour Party fundamentally has the same values I don't recognise that I am from any faction in the Labour Party. These, thing, these labels have often been given to me. So a bit unfair, you think, some, sometimes? Oh, yeah, that's life. 
That's politics. People, people will pigeonhole you for all sorts of different reasons, whether it's your sex, your, your class, your, where you come from, whether you come from a town or a city. Most people in the country want the same things. And I, I think that we put these terrible dividing lines in. But my experience of the Labour Party is that they w agree with me on most things, whether that's welfare, whether that's families' rights, whether that's LGBTQ rights, women's rights. I don't see the divergence that's constantly presented to me. Um, we've got four women yes. and one man yeah. in the Labour leadership context. Yeah. Is that the first time that's ever happened? How do you think it would look if the Labour Party ended up electing another man? True to form. <laughs> um, the Labour Party, it, it, has a, it has a blind spot in this regard, it always has. And it, it is, it, it, it's genuinely frustrating because the Labour Party is absolutely, if you set the test as being how it has improved the life of women in the country, how it has fought for women's representation, how it fights for women in politics at almost every level, except that one um, and so I think it it does a disservice to the Labour Party's record on women but I think it would look bad if I was honest. Yeah in <laughs> April when we met um, last year you told me it would be a massive embarrassment if the yeah. Labour Party once again fails to have a woman leader. Well I mean I, I, I think that I fairly I, uh, pretty much especially when there's one man in the race and four women. Um, so you think it would be a bit embarrassing? Yeah, I think it, it will be embarrassing. And, and what's more, it gives absolute grist to the mill and ammunition to our other side. I've had, you know, Tory members of Parliament like laughing at us after the last time, especially when um, Theresa May, because it, they had an all-women shortlist, didn't they? Because it was Theresa May and Andrea Leadsom. Um, you know, it's, it's not great if we can't ever seem to think that the women are good enough it's always some, it, when you're a woman in politics, you're always the next time, or it'll be your turn next time. When you're a woman in politics, it's always like, you're always told we, we have to pick the best person for the job, as if that best person, what they, they never mean the best person, they often mean the best man. And that is disappointing. Do you think men need to step aside sometimes? I think that, if you truly believe in women's representation, sometimes, and that, that goes not just for just women in the way that that intersects in other areas, that sometimes passing the mic is the greatest way to show that you truly believe in something. But I think it's a very, very difficult argument to say you should stand back if you truly believe you're the best person for the job. Uh, Jess Phillips, thank you very much. No